Look, game design is hard and takes a long time, and making the beginning of a game can be the hardest part. If you want the player to enjoy the game, then they need an understanding of how to play it. You can't just start playing Street Uno and take their money, you gotta teach them the rules first, then take their money. But oftentimes, especially with video games, players don't want to have to sit through a bunch of tutorials, they just want to jump right into it. So how do you balance the player's need to learn to play the game and the player's want to start having fun as soon as possible? Well, in the olden times of the mid-2000s, and earlier, games came with physical manuals that you were expected to read before playing, like a board game. I always read them in the car ride home from Walmart, the anticipation building until you finally got home and I got to start playing Paper Mario, the good one. But apparently, I was the only person who read the manuals because game designers stopped making them because no one else was reading them. So instead, tutorials are now baked into the beginning of the game. How you start a game and how you teach the player varies depending on multiple factors, such as how long the game is and how complex the game is. Is. There's no blanket right way to do it. There's no every game should do it this way secret formula, but there are better ways to do it and definitely uh, worse ways to do it. But of all the games that I've played, I think Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild has one of the strongest and most fitting openings to a game and has one of the best tutorial sections ever, that being the Great Plateau. Here's how it does it. Also saying Breath of the Wild every time is a mouthful, so I'm going to call it Buttwa for the rest of the video. The game starts and you wake up in a cave after what looks to be a nice spa day with very little info to go off of and a straight line path out of this cave. Immediately the game does tutorial step one, teach the player the controls. Obviously knowing which buttons do what is essential to playing any game. And this section can be tricky to design since there will always be players with varying experience levels. Some people have played a billion video games, some people have played zero video games, some people have purchased dozens of video games but actually played very few of them. I know some people people where Butwa was their first ever video game. And Butwa had the added challenge of being released the same day as a new console, the Switch, so some players might not even be familiar with where some of the buttons are. Butwa accounts for this by having the controls appear in quick, easy to read prompts on the screen, showing where the buttons are on the controller whenever a relevant mechanic comes up. It's not super complicated. The game quickly teaches you moving, getting dressed and climbing, three essential activities, and you pick up the Sheikah Slate, Nintendo's greatest prank of all time. They tricked everyone into buying just a Wii U gamepad as a whole console, and then tricked everyone again into giving a 10 out of 10 to a game where the most vital tool is a Wii U gamepad. You run outside and see the money shot. It's so beautiful. Your worldview is immediately expanded from a hyper-focused tunnel to a broad horizon. The camera then pans over to a building in an old man, which brings me to tutorial step two, teaching the player the game mechanics. Right after the cutscene, you get one of the most genius moves in game design history. Eloquent in its simplicity, it's so evocative in its effectiveness. The stick. No, I'm serious. Putting the stick here was smart because it conveys so much so easily. One, collectible items will sparkle on the ground. Two, you will collect multiple weapons since it's safe to assume you won't be using a stick for the whole game. Three, if you're really paying attention, you know that weapons will break since the stick isn't gonna last very long. This video is not the place to go into the weapon durability dust course. Because I've already made a critically acclaimed video on the topic, just know that weapon durability is good actually. You talk to the old man he tells you very little info, sassy little grandpa, but he does point you in the right direction. There are apples nearby and a baked apple next to the fire, giving the player a preview of two new mechanics, the physics engine with game objects changing state based on different stimuli, and the cooking system, fire plus raw materials equals new thing. Even if you've played every 3D Zelda game before, there's a lot of new stuff to buttwa. You collect apples at a nearby tree and the prompt tells you that this is how you restore your health in this game, not by finding floating hearts the game, but by gobbling down some food and munching some coochie cooking. Earlier in the tunnel, you learned about equipping different clothes to change your stats, and you can even find pants in a nearby chest to increase your defense further. But the game doesn't make you put on the clothes. You get to choose what to wear, but if you don't put anything on, the game will subtly remind you, Oi, get dressed, because uh, maybe you forgot to do it. And you also have the ability to climb almost any wall, but you gotta watch out then now, because it costs stamina to do so. Link. The man can climb anything. If you bought the DLC, 
you get an immersion breaking shirt that I am absolutely going to wear. There's even a dedicated jump button you can use all the time. There hasn't been one of those since I think like Zelda 2? You'll fight enemies, usually one at a time near the beginning, and enemy camps being a little further out, and take their weapons, a mechanic from Wind Waker. But in Butwa, you'll get to keep the weapons in your inventory, not just in that one room. Again, this all seems like simple stuff, and that's the point. Keep things simple and effective at the start. The game is introducing new players to its mechanics and reprogramming the mindset of returning Zelda players, since most of this is new stuff. As you progress, other techniques are explained in the corner of the screen when they become relevant in a way that doesn't interrupt the player, and you can reread them at any time in the pause menu. After activating a tower, Hobo Santa will glide over to you and he'll trade you his paraglider for the treasure in the nearby tower. You'll need the paraglider to get off the plateau, and you want to get off the plateau because of that money shot earlier, showing you that submissive and breedable world to explore. You go to the shrine and get the Magnesis ability, which turns you into Magneto from X-Men to move around metal objects. The shrine is quick and simple to understand, and if you're really skilled, you can grab the chest from up top. You complete the shrine and receive a spirit orb, which you don't know what it does yet, and a heartfelt message from the Zelda series producer Eiji Anuma, whose name is an anagram for the shrine name. After completing the shrine and walking outside, you'll see metal crates that are also compatible with Magnesis. This is a common thing with these shrines, being able to test out the abilities in the overworld as soon as you get it. The old man will swoop in again, flexing that paraglider on you, and he will reveal his true capitalist nature by changing the terms of your previously agreed upon deal. You gotta do three more shrines before he'll give you the paraglider. Where they at? Well, you can fast travel back to the tower and take a look. During the fast travel, the game gives you more helpful tips you can read while the game is loading, which is a great use of dead space to further teach the player more intricate tips without interrupting them. On top of the tower, you'll use the Sheikah Slate scope to find the other three shrines. And this brings me to tutorial step three, teaching the player the game design philosophy. Not only what you can do, but also how you're going to do it. Basically the gameplay loop. You're gonna navigate to the shrines, then you're gonna do the puzzle in the shrine and get the orbs. That's the game. There's no direct path to any of the shrines, there's no yellow brick road leading you to your destination. You gotta figure out how to get there yourself. Navigation is part of the experience. You gotta climb up to that shrine all the way up there in Chicago, but your stamina is too low because Gatorade hasn't been invented yet. Find another route. Oh look, there are some outcroppings teaching the player that you can climb and rest. Climb and rest. Spider-Man with asthma. Climb and rest. There's no specific sequence of events explaining this. There's no tutorial character who pops up and says, Hey Link, you gotta do it this way. No, game objects are placed in a specific way to guide the player, but the player has to make the connections. And as a result, they feel like they're figuring everything out for themselves. The game is teaching you without you feeling like you're being lectured to. The player figures it out on their own, rather than being interrupted with a tutorial or having to follow a linear path. The game caters both to newer and more experienced players alike. For new Newer players, if you're stuck and need help, you can ask the mysteriously teleporting old man for advice, but the game never forces you to. And even though this is technically a tutorial section, there's optional challenges for more experienced players. You can wander into the Forest of Spirits, a section of the plateau you don't need to go into to complete the shrines, where you can run into a stone talus, a boss monster, telling the player that A, you'll run into bosses in the overworld if you look hard enough, B, you can run away from this and not get punished, as opposed to older Zelda games where the boss door would seal behind you, and C, this is a challenging fight at this point, but if you have enough resources like apples and arrows, you can beat it. Maybe if you, I don't know, prepare enough, you'll be able to beat stronger enemies. Hmm, I wonder if that's the central theme of the entire game. So with enough preparation, you'll be able to beat it like I did, because as you all know, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm pretty amazing at video games. To get to the Bomb Shrine, you'll have to go through the ruins of the Eastern Abbey, which is full of guardians. This is the game's way of subtly telling the player, combat isn't the only option, maybe try sneaking around. There were dedicated sneaking sections in some of the older games, and they were... <sighs> Fine, but in Butwa, you the player chooses when to sneak. This is also the game's way of telling you that guardians are, uh, bad dudes. You don't need to receive a telepathic message from Zelda saying, Link, guardians will murder you. Instead, the frantic music in the otherwise quiet game and the glowing red laser pointing at you is a pretty intuitive and wordless way of telling the player, Danger, danger. But again, if you're looking for a challenge, skilled players can reflect the... Uh, skilled players can reflect the... 
God dang it. Skilled players can reflect the guardian laser and kill them in one hit, just like I did. First try, cause I'm amazing at video games. That's another new aspect of Butwa. You will die, a lot. Previous Zelda games, I would get through the entire game no problem. Hearts are on screen just for show. But with Butwa, death is gonna be a lot more frequent. But it's not a big deal. The plateau is confined to areas so you won't get warped back too far and won't lose any resources because of it. Death mostly serves as a reset point to tell the player, hey Dumbo, maybe try something else next time. But I never got that warning though because as you all know, I'm uh, I'm, 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 I'm pretty amazing at video games. There are multiple solutions to problems, and the game doesn't punish you for doing things the wrong way. Because there is no wrong way. For example, the Cryona Shrine is up at the top of a mountain in the cold, and in Butwa you'll take damage if you go into cold unprepared. And there are a ton of ways to get there, and all of them are valid. There are summer wing butterflies and monsters all over the Great Plateau. If you figured out sneaking, you can catch the butterflies, and the description says, mix them up with monster parts to make an elixir to protect you from the cold. There's the old man's diary which talks about if you make him a certain meal, he'll give you the the warm doublet to wear in the cold, or warm double if you're nasty. Near one entrance to the cold area, there will be hot peppers you can cook to protect you from the cold. There are also campfires near the entrance, and standing near fire warms your body up, just like real life. With this knowledge, you can light a wooden weapon on fire and just carry it all the way up there. If you want to brute force it, you can just run and eat an apple or something to heal every couple of steps. And if you accidentally climb the wrong mountain and reach the highest point of the plateau, the old man will be up there and he'll just give you the warm doublet. And if you don't get it here, you can go back to his house and get it later. You get rewarded for your exploration in Butwa. Right near their start, there's interesting looking flowers at a lake, and if you jump down there, there will be a Korok seed. You're constantly discovering in this game. There's even something behind the waterfall, like all video games with waterfalls should have. Everyone loves the bow and arrow, but on repeat playthroughs, if you want the bow and arrow, you gotta play like 10 plus hours before you can get it. In Butwa, five minutes in, go to Temple of Time, hanging right, boom, you got a bow. Kill an enemy with a bow, it's your bow now. Go off and do some more exploring, boom, fire arrows. In the previous game, you have to play like 20 hours before you got fire arrows. All the fun tools are very front-loaded in Butwa, so you can do your cool X-Men powers right at the start of the game. Unlike the American schooling system, this game prepares you with all the knowledge you'll need for the rest of your journey. However, it doesn't reveal everything about the game all at once. There are still many new features of Butwa to discover, such as villages, story sections, and force. Force. But as I've said before, this isn't like other Zelda games, it's like a cool Zelda game. Because this one goes back to the very first Zelda game, where you're dropped into a world and told to figure it out, dummy. I mean, of course that game came with a manual too. But in previous 3D Zelda games, you had to do the tutorial in the exact order it wanted you to. Hey Link, come do the telescope tutorial. Hey Link, come do the sword tutorial. Hey Link, come use some grass to summon a hawk to launch it into a monkey to grab a cradle to get a fishing rod to get a cat to go home then smash some pumpkins to find money to buy the slingshot to kill a spider on your ladder to get the sword. What? These aren't bad ways to start a game, but on repeat playthroughs, this is always the part you speed through so you can get to the good part. I don't think that anyone is looking forward to the part where you learn about L targeting, but in Breath of the Wild, there's so much more autonomy in the order you learn about the game. You're truly given freedom. Oh god, not like that. While the game subtly points you in the right direction, the sequence of events I listed earlier, you very much do not have to do. You can ignore the old man entirely and just do the shrines. And even if you do follow the guided path laid out, the game is so much less hand-holding with its tutorials. Yes, there are times when you need to stop the player to tell them something important, but these moments are quick and rare. The vast majority of players don't like being interrupted in the middle of gameplay to have to read a bunch of prompts. Most people play the video game to play the video game. Tutorial step four, it's immediately engaging. On top of great gameplay and the gorgeous world, the game is interesting right from the start. In previous Zelda games, you start in a village with everything calm and peaceful, doing village stuff like handling goats and playing Dodge the Snot. Butwa instead uses Enmedius Res, but the player starts with nothing but a voice telling you to wake up. No info, no exposition, no long cutscene you watch at the start, you just wake up. So assuming you're going into this game blind, you've already got some questions. Where am I? Why am I naked? Who's this old man? What is his deal? How is he everywhere I am before I even get there? Who is this voice in my head? I have no idea who this possibly could be. Why are there no other people around? 
around. What's that purple stuff? Then there's the environmental storytelling. Ruined buildings show signs of a previous battle. All these rusty objects and moss covered rocks show passage of time. What happened in this place? Hmm, it looks like some sort of, I don't know, great calamity must have happened here. As an easter egg, previous Zelda players will remember the Temple of Time. Why is it in ruins? People naturally want answers. This sense of mystery and desire for answers drives the player forwards. In exploring the plateau, the player is given all sorts of questions and after going through the trials and tribulations of getting to the shrines and meeting up the old man again, you're given what's known in the writing biz as an earned exposition moment. You have a ton of questions, you persevere through challenges, and now you finally get some answers to your questions. You can't just start them off with the answers, you gotta, you gotta tease them a little bit to get them interested. Do a little bit of a narrative foreplay. The Great Plateau is essentially a mini Zelda game in and of itself. It serves as a microcosm for everything you're going to do in the game. You will explore and navigate the world at your own pace and in whatever direction you want. Complete shrines to earn spirit orbs to upgrade your health and stamina. Collect food, clothes, and weapons in your quest to go from Link to Lank and beat the final boss. Thanks for watching and don't forget to use your stasis rune into that subscribe button and then slam into it with your sledgehammer, I don't know man. Leave a comment below of what games you think have good tutorial sections in them and uh, that's it, video's over.